Today is September 10th, 2019. And that makes it a very exciting and important day. Or at least for me it is. But why is that? Well, let's find out. Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale, first came out in 1985, and it's an absolute classic of dystopian literature. In The Handmaid's Tale, the United States of America, as we know it, no longer exists, and in its place is Gilead. Now, Gilead is a theonomic military dictatorship in which women's rights in particular have been massively, massively, massively impaired. And by that I mean that women's political, uh, economic and bodily autonomy have been compromised. So the novel focuses primarily on a character called Offred, who is one of the handmaids from the title. The novel explores her life before, in the build-up to, and during the oppressive new regime that is established in The Handmaid's Tale. It also offers glimpses of rebellion and hope, but those glimpses are uncertain and full of doubt. Now, it's a brilliant book and I don't want to give too much away, so I strongly recommend that you read it yourself. However, The Handmaid's Tale was also part of the resurgence of dystopian literature in the second half of the 2010s, 20-teens, whatever you call them. And so, because of that resurgence of dystopian literature, or maybe even contributing towards it, in 2017, The Handmaid's Tale was adapted into a television series by Hulu. And it featured Elizabeth Moss as Offred. So The Handmaid's Tale is a pretty important novel in the dystopian genre. But why am I going on about that today? Well, give me a couple seconds. And so today, 34 years after the initial release of The Handmaid's Tale, the sequel, The Testaments, is finally out. Okay, so I've just been to Waterstones and got my copy. Uh, I'm now sat under a tree, because uh, I quite like sitting under trees, to be honest, uh, especially when the weather's quite nice. So I'm gonna sit under the tree and read for a bit, and. And I'll, I'll come back in a moment really and give you some uh, early initial impressions, I guess. Actually, before I get too stuck in, uh, I just want to give a shout out to one of my former classes. I won't say which class they were in particular or name any names, just you know, safeguarding reasons. But they gave me, as part of my leaving gift, a Waterstones voucher, gift cardy thing. And I have redeemed part of it in order to, to buy this book. So shout out to them they're an awesome bunch of kids uh, hopefully they're watching this thanks guys honestly and uh, good luck with your future studies but now we can get stuck in and read some of the book So I'm a little over a quarter of the way through the novel, uh, so just a little over 100 pages or so, and I must say it is awesome. 
Um, the first thing that really stands out to me is that the uh, the novel isn't just one story necessarily, but instead it's split into uh, three different narratives, or, or rather the three different narratives are all going on at the same time, uh, which is really interesting because each narrative is giving a different perspective of the world of Gilead that was introduced in The Handmaid's Tale. The three narratives I don't think they've necessarily intertwined or overlapped just yet um, but I think there's definitely some potential for it and well I'm gonna throw throw it out there I predict that that's gonna happen at some point uh, I don't know necessarily in a big way or not but I think those narratives might intertwine a little bit um, and I hope they do because I think it's quite it'd be quite an interesting thing to see and you know still got about 300 odd pages to see and uh, see that happening hopefully for me, it's also been very interesting because uh, each strand of the narrative is uh, metafictional in one way or another. Um, you know, they're told, or they seem to be told as documents, which is something that you did see a bit in The Handmaid's Tale as well. So something quite interesting happening there. And uh, yeah, I think there's going to be some interesting things that are very, very relevant and important to me moving forwards with the PhD so fingers crossed that happens and it's uh, something that I can comment on and think about and write about certainly I think it's awesome at the moment and uh, yeah I'm hoping that continues I'm gonna uh, probably mm, now nah, I'm not gonna do any video editing I'm just gonna go straight back into reading uh, I've only got a couple hours at home because I've got something quite interesting and exciting to go to later this evening which i will tell you about then so uh see you in a moment so those of you with a keen eye will have noticed that i'm out and about again i'm back on the move and that's because i've got a very important date with a very interesting and important lady i mean look i've got a new shirt on and all so uh I'll show you more about that in just a moment. The National Theatre in London was hosting an event called In Conversation with Margaret Atwood, which was being broadcast live in cinemas across the UK. And luckily enough, the cinema in my small hometown was showing it. Now, I wasn't going to be foolish enough to vlog the actual screening, so you'll have to deal with my voiceover instead. I went into the event with few expectations. I knew that Atwood would be talking about the Testaments, and I knew that there'd be some readings, but that was about it. So I sat there in my seat with a notepad and pen, and yes, I made notes, pretty weird for being in a cinema and my popcorn poised delicately on the arm of the chair. And it was brilliant. Anne Dowd, retaining her role of Aunt Lydia from the Handmaid's Tale TV series, read the novel's opening chapter. Sally Hawkins and Lily James read excerpts from the novel's two other protagonists. And Atwood herself was simply phenomenal. She was captivating and charming and funny. She said that she was interested in thinking about how regimes fall apart, claimed that she has always been pretty interested in forgeries, and defended The Handmaid's Tale, saying that it is indeed optimistic, as optimism is seen in the symposium at the end of the novel, something that is reworked in an interesting way in The Testaments. Atwood was asked about what had inspired her to write the Testaments, and why now, after more than 30 years since The Handmaid's Tale. And she said she was inspired, in part, by Donald Trump's election to the US presidency. And then I walked home, my mind whirring with ideas. I've just come out of the cinema, and uh, yeah, wow, I've got a lot of thoughts in my brain right now. and. Probably they're not altogether very coherent right now, just like how the autofocus isn't particularly coherent right now either. Hello, my face. 
When I loosely planned making this video, I intended on recording my thoughts and opinions at regular intervals, say every 50 pages or every hour or so. And I don't have any of that footage because I didn't make it. I couldn't tear myself away from reading the book, not even for five minutes. I finished the book the day after it came out and I've spent the rest of the week allowing my brain to digest what I had read. My review is simple. I cannot fault this book. Perhaps I'm biased or I've been caught up in the hype or something like that, but I genuinely cannot find anything to criticise. The setting of the novel takes what was already firmly established in The Handmaid's Tale and makes it something hyper real. The characters have distinct voices, which is apparent in both their narration and their flawlessly executed dialogue. Stakes are high, motivations are believable, and the plot feels right. Nothing happens just because Atwood needs it to happen. Everything happens because the story needs it to happen. Although writing from multiple alternating perspectives is nothing new, Atwood uses this structure masterfully. Whenever a chapter ended, I felt sad knowing that I wouldn't pick up that character's narrative for another 50 pages or so. And yet I was also thrilled because it meant that I was about to dive right back in to another character's narrative. It is the use of mini cliffhangers and hooks that makes this structure work, I think. And generally, just thinking about the novel's writing, it is, as you would expect from an Atwood novel, sublime. It's very rare that I completely lose myself in a novel these days and devote my entire brain to it. And yet, I did for this novel. The 420 or so pages went by in a flash and it's left me wanting so much more. Atwood said that The Handmaid's Tale was set at the beginning of Gilead and that The Testaments is mid-Gilead. Well, now I want to see late Gilead. I want to see life as an econo wife, or a Martha, as an angel, or an eye, or, or even as Commander Judd himself. If you've read The Handmaid's Tale, you must read this. If you're a fan of dystopian fiction, you must read this. If you're a fan of what is simply put sublime writing, you must read this. I admit I was a bit sceptical when I saw that The Testaments was Booker shortlisted before it had even come out. And now I can't think of anything more deserving of it. It is certainly the best thing I've read all year. So that is the video over. This review vlog hybrid is something of a new style for me so I'd appreciate any feedback you may have whatsoever. I've also included a link to a Guardian article down in the description. And in that article, you will find the first chapter from each of the three different perspectives. So just in case you're still sat on the fence, you can read those and maybe make your own mind up. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.